there you go. Uh, a little bit of the song, How Deep Is the Father's Love for Us, sounds like a hymn, but actually it is a modern uh, song. Sounds like it's 100 years old, but actually it was not uh, written not all that long ago. Um, so it was great, a great, uh, great little song to, to start us out with um, today. I do have sheet music for that, so if you're interested in that, uh, shoot me an email at service at, or excuse me, yeah, service at guitargathering.com, and we can uh, we can work that out. Nancy is saying, Nancy, good to see you. Uh, what was that, memorized or improv? That was, uh, uh, well, it's it's memorized, I guess, since I don't have music in front of me, but I have written, I have written the music out for that, so there you go. Uh, the, and I'm playing on my Gibson J45. <laughs> Um, what you are hearing is direct from my guitar into into the sound. So, um, I am using uh, Elixir strings on these. I like the Elixir lights, and but I have been trying out the new uh, Diodario um, XS. I think is the new ones that they've tried out. I tried them out last week when I was doing some uh, performing, and uh, I really liked them. They're a little bit brighter than these, and so I, it, they sounded particularly good on this guitar. So. Um, I li I'm starting to starting to experiment with the the X I believe they're called XSs from Diodario, the new ones, and uh, I really like them. So uh, this is this is the elixirs, my old faithful elixirs that I like. There, I like the nano webs. They've got the poly webs, which has the r really thick coating on them. I like the nano webs, which is just a much lighter coating on it. It lets the the string ring out a bit more. Um, okay, as we're getting into questions, please put them in all caps and just let me know. I'll try and do the best I can to, to, to solve them. Uh, TGF is saying, guitar questions and advice, hoping to find out if there's a problem having different guitars with different scale lengths and nut widths. I was told, don't do it. Okay, um, well, here's the deal with that. Um, different types of guitars have different um, neck radiuses. Uh, let me grab this this uh, classical guitar from behind me. This is my J45. It has a nut radius of an inch and seven eighths. And so its neck size is a standard neck size. Now a classical guitar has a neck size that's slightly larger. I don't know whether you can see this. Try and get where you can see that. The neck size is slightly uh, wider. This is a two-inch neck for the uh, classical guitar, the nylon string guitar. That's a two-inch neck. So the inch and seven-eighths, that's what it's going to be on a uh, electric, and two inches is what's going to be on any sort of nylon string. So that's the nut width. That's the, the neck width. Now the other thing that he mentions is scale length. Okay, so scale length is another issue. So if I have a Strat, which I, I do have one, but I don't have one here within arm's reach, on a Strat, um, they have a certain uh, scale length, certain length of string. But on this Les Paul I've got right here, it has, you think it's the same, but it's actually slightly, slightly uh, less, slightly less string um, than a uh, Strat. Why do that? Well, you can control different things. The the you can bend a little bit easier. It's a little slinkier on a on a um, uh, Les Paul. So uh, they have slight advantages. Now, having said that, is this a big deal? No. I mean, the short answer is no. Uh, is it? Should I? Oh my goodness! I can only do one. I can only do, no 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 no. I switch between them all the time. This is a. This is that. Let me let me play this, and it takes me all of about thirty seconds to kind of warm up to the wider neck. So, once I get this bad boy in tune, just takes a second for me to get the uh, get used to the wider neck. So I would say overall, it's not anything you need to worry about. It's certainly not going to throw you off in any sort of major way.
So, I mean, you, you can get used to them fairly easily. So is there a difference? Yes. Is it a big critical difference that, oh my goodness, if you play one, you're going to be screwed up playing the other? No, not really. Not really. Uh, good question. Greg is asking, uh, is that J45 a 12-inch uh, radius neck, and how do you find that versus a 16-inch neck Martin? The short answer is, Greg, I wish I knew. I, I, I don't know that level of detail in in uh, um, the radiuses of the neck. I know, uh, here here's all I know on that, Greg. You would think that a nice thin neck, like this has a very thin, thin neck. I've got a Godin that has a very thin neck too. And it's very comfortable to play for short periods of time. But I have, a, I have my Telecaster, which has a really thick, beefy neck on it. At first I didn't like it at all. It just was terrible. But wow, you play a four-hour uh, playing session, and that thick neck feels great. That thick neck really feels good there, because it just, it, it playing a, a long session on these thinner neck guitars, I just have to support my hand so much. When I have that thicker neck, I can just relax my hand a little bit more. So there is some differences there in, in neck radius. You wouldn't think that the shape of the neck would be a big deal, but it actually is quite a big deal, and they're, they vary widely. For those of you who don't know, the the shape of the neck, this little this little curve of the neck, is is changes quite a bit between different guitars, and with even within the same guitar, on uh, uh, you know the same type like a J45, you can get various types of neck radiuses on it if you want a special order and stuff like that. So it does make a difference. So uh, just think about that. The thicker necks tend to be a little bit more comfortable for me than the thinner necks long-term, long-term. Uh, Robert is saying, is there a way to make a typically non-guitar song flow well in an intermediate guitar style? I'm not quite sure I'm following you exactly, Robert. Are you talking about um, uh, maybe a, like a song that's pre predominantly keyboard-based and trying to make it into a, like a fingerstyle arrangement? That's what I think you're probably asking. Um, First thing I would do when I'm trying to kind of get any song and make it guitar-friendly is I would put it in a guitar-friendly key, uh, which is usually one of the caged keys, C, E, uh, G, A, and D. Um, those are kind of guitar-friendly keys, so I would try and get it into that key. Uh, I would look at the range of the melody. If it gets, you know, you kind of want the, the range of the melody between, you know, maybe about there, maybe a D maybe up to a high G or high A if I'm going to adjust and make a fingerstyle arrangement of it out. So I can get higher, but just kind of realize if I get higher and I'm constantly up here, then I kind of lose some of the the, the voicings that I can do down under. Uh, but I don't want to get the, t the, the... I don't want to voice it too low. It just gets too low if I voice it. So you have to kind of voice it correctly. Um, I don't know if that was the answer to your question or not, uh, Robert, but uh, that's what I thought you were asking there. When looking at a song, Mark is asking, when looking at a song to learn and the song has chords and tab, how do you play them together? All right. Um, if I'm looking at a song, well, I don't, it depends on what you're trying to do with it, Mark. If it's just kind of a melody and then it has chords on top, and the melody may be written in maybe in standard notation and in tab, then uh, you've basically got two parts happening. You've got the chordal accompaniment happening, the... Let me switch back over to my steel string. I've got the chords. And I've got the melody. Now, Generally, if I'm doing a song, I'm not doing the melody. Uh, the vocal's doing the melody, or, or the singer, or the other instruments are doing the melody. So I'm most of the time in an accompaniment role. So I would be just paying attention to the chords on top. But if I needed to play the, the melody part of it, then I would look down at the tab. So you're not really playing both of them at the same time, unless you're trying to make that into a uh, fingerstyle solo guitar arrangement, which is probably not what you're going to do if you have just a tab line and chords on the top. That's probably uh, just a, a uh, whether you're, where you're supposed to just play the, the tab and then be aware of the harmony that's going on up at the top, not that you're playing both at the same time. Uh, Dan Stankert is saying, I've learned 
uh, all I know about guitar in theory from you. Wow, that's a lot of pressure on me to make sure I, I do that. I've been asked if I could play some basic bass in our church band. How hard would it be to transition to four-string bass? Four-string bass is easy. Easy, easy, easy. Basically, the four strings on a bass are the lower four strings of a guitar. E, A, D, and G. So if you've been playing guitar with six strings, switching to four-string bass is generally easier. It's just less things you have to keep track of. You're not worried necessarily about chords too much. You're mainly playing single notes. So you have to kind of get your wrap your head around uh, how a bass player approaches things as opposed to how a a, a guitar player would approach things. You're kind of playing roots and fifths, and 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 um, you kind of have to th you know think like a bass player. You have to think like a bass player. I'm on my picking. I'm generally doing maybe one and two together. Or thump that way, or you can do one alternating, like you're walking, that sort of a thing. Okay, uh, so that's some ideas on bass. Um, and I would encourage everybody to try it. Bass is relatively easy. I, I've played bass quite a bit uh, for various things, and, and uh, uh, you know, bass is something you'll always need. Thank you to whoever uh, just gave the $24.99 there. Thank you so much. Uh, that certainly appreciates. I, I don't know what name went with that, but I, uh, 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 I think it's Robert oh, Robert, is that, is that you, Robert? Okay, thank you so much. We've, we certainly appreciate that. Um, the, on the bass that you're doing, um, you have to kind of think, when I do it, I have to think like a bass player, but and sometimes you'll be reading bass clef. Well, that's, well, that gets tricky, but as far as just playing the notes and the chords, that's fairly easy. So I'd encourage everybody to kind of mess around with bass. It's a good thing to know. Um, uh, Larry Johnson is saying, how do I cre increase finger style speed? Um, well, first of all, speed is, is, is a really, uh, uh, you got to kind of think about speed a completely different way. Speed is not just going, I'm going to play as fast as I can. That's not how you build up speed. How you really build up speed is you get you get a metronome, which I don't happen to have one here. Right? Oh, maybe I do. Yeah, I do. Okay, so I would grab a metronome. Here it is, it's 60 beats per minute. Sixty beats per minute. This is just an app on my phone called Metro Timer. Metro Timer. It's a great little uh, app. Uh, I like it because it clicks instead of beeps. So I, I, it gives me, it's giving me a, a thing. And how I would build it up is I would do maybe 16th notes for that, maybe just P, I, M, and A, thumb, one, two, three. Maybe we'll start with eighth notes, maybe they'd be better. Maybe I can do triplets. And you get that really comfortable. Try different bass notes, different chords. All I'm doing is thumb two, one, three. Thumb two, one, three. And you're just going through various progressions. Does it matter what the progressions are? No. I'm trying different finger combinations. Okay, and then I slowly crag it up. Sixteenths.
speed it up, and then I do 70, and then I do 75, and then I do 80, and you're slowly working your way up. It's Building up speed is a slow, methodical, layer upon layer way of doing it. Uh, what doesn't work is going, I'm going to play as fast as I can. Wait a minute, I'll do it this time. You could waste too much time doing it that way. Don't do it that way. Um, uh, William, would I recommend the Christopher Parkening method for a new guitarist? Okay, depends on what you want to learn. Christopher Parkening, great. His method, great. But it's, it, it, it's, um, it's for classical guitarists, okay? It's not to say anything against it. I mean, it's just very specific in one style. It's great in that style. That's kind of the textbook book for classical when you're doing classical at a university level. So realize it's going to get ramped up pretty quick. Um, would I recommend that for a new guitarist? Probably not. Probably not, because I it, it just ramps up a little too quick. So I would recommend maybe some other resources than that. I mean, you can always use that and supplement it, but it, it does go from zero to sixty. Way it's kind of meant to to for for um, um, uh, persons who already have some guitar ability and they're just getting introduced to classical guitar style. So it's great. I don't, I don't have it. It's been a year since I've looked at it. But from what I remember, it does get advanced fairly quickly. So I would, I would say uh, uh, it's a great resource. But you might look at, at some other things, too, if you just want to kind of layer some things up. And now I did a great course, too. I did a, a course, a Gib course, Gibson's Learn and Master Guitar. Um, did that, you know, years ago. But the content is, is, is great. And it goes slow enough. If you get the bonus workshops and things like that, that generally has time for people to, to not feel overwhelmed by it. So that's something you might check out as well. Um, um, David is saying, do I prefer Gibson or Fender? Uh, uh, it's a, it's, it's, um, uh, do you prefer red or blue? Well, it uh, depends on what you're trying to do with what. So if I'm trying to get a Fender sound, I can't get it out of a Gibson. If I'm trying to get that Gibson humbucking sound, I can't get it out of a Fender. So it's just tools. What, which do you like better, a flathead screwdriver or a Phillips head? It's, they're just tools. So um, 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 what do I prefer? It's, it's strictly just color. Um, I play a, a Telecaster for may, most of my live playing just because it's so versatile because I've got all kinds of different pickups in it. So that's kind of what I generally do. Uh, Barry is saying, do I, do I play any classical guitar? Well, as a matter of fact, I, I, I teach classical guitar at a university. So, uh, yes, I do play classical guitar. Um, I don't really have any songs right here in front of me, but I can sure fake something. Let's see. call for you there or maybe let's see uh um.
There you go. There's a little bit of classical. Hey, Lee is Lee Bailey is asking, what tuner am I using? I heartily recommend. This is called a Polytune by TC Electronics. Polytune T by TC Electronics. Uh, it's a little bit more pricey than your average kind of snark tuner, but it is about 10 times more accurate. <laughs> so uh, I would, it's easy to get uh, 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 a cheap tuner. It's a little bit trickier to get a one that's, that's uh, a little bit more accurate. So this one I can do, it senses the vibrations like, well, there's no way you really can see it, but um, it'll do all the strings. If I just play all the strings, it'll show me which ones are out of tune. And if I do one, then it will just give me that one. When it's dead set in the, in the green, yeah, I've got it. So it's a great little tuner. If you pick these, I, what I needed was in the studio, I was finding that those little um, snarks and things like that, nothing against snark. It's a great, inexpensive, good tuner, knock around tuner. But it, it, for, for, for professional uh, use, uh, when I've got an $8,000 mic aimed four inches from my guitar, I was finding that it just wasn't accurate enough. It would kind of get me in the ballpark, but it wasn't accurate enough. So um, these are much more accurate. Now, uh, so I'm I'm loving these. And you can knock them around and throw them in a case. It's about 40 bucks, I think, for these little TC Electronics Polytunes. Hey, let me show you one more while we're talking about tuners. Uh, regarding tuning apps, here's the one I like. The iStrobo Soft by Peterson Tuners. Now, I, I don't make any money from any of this stuff, so this is just my professional opinion. Now, if you're not used to reading a strobe tuner, this is going to freak you out. But it is so accurate. It is so accurate. So let me get to where he can see me. So there's the A. Now you'll notice it's reading, that's saying I'm reading a little sharp, which on my TC Electronics, it didn't even pick that up. And the idea is that you're tr it's measuring all the overtones and things like that too. A little bit better. There you go. So the Strobo Soft is is great. It's like four bucks, four or five bucks in the app store. I uh, I Strobo Soft is the name of the tuner by Peterson. Great app, great little app. Um, and it gets it right on. Um, um, let's see. Uh, Keith is uh, saying Martins are longer scale necks than Gibsons. Does that affect them tonally? Tonally, no. No, because the because the width of the the frets is made up for it, so it's not really going to affect anything tonally. What affects tonally is woods, and and uh, you know picks and things like that, types of strings, things like that. That's going to what's affect the tone, uh, not necessarily the scale length. Wouldn't really have anything to do with that much. Um, let me just say a word on that, if I can. Um, what matters on acoustic guitars is woods, strings, things like that. Attack. But but music stores and guitar manufacturers, they will they will, you know, spend oodles on marketing to try and convince you that it is um, you know, on an electric guitar that it is, you know, this kind of wood and that sort of stuff. Well, yeah, maybe it might have, oh, I don't know, a 0.2% uh, effect on your tone. What's going to affect your guitar on an, a class, on, excuse me, on an electric is the pickups. Is, that's about, oh, 90% of it uh, is going to be the pickups. And then what kind of pick are you using? And your touch, overall touch on the instrument is the biggest factor in all of that. So uh, does the neck, whether it's, it's you know, got varnish on it or not, does that matter? On an electric, not really. Can I just tell you? I play for a living and it really doesn't matter. What's giving you the tone is, first of all, you, your fingers. Um, if I handed my guitar to Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, it would still sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan. If, if, I, if I was playing Stevie Ray Vaughan's guitar, it would sound like me 
playing Stevie Ray Vaughan's guitar. So most of your tone is in your fingers. Okay. Um, there you go. Uh, Mike H. saying, uh, learning fingerstyle guitar, is there a fingerstyle... Uh, Learning fingerstyle guitar. Is there a fingerstyle guitar, or is my Taylor 714 good to go? Well, there's not really a, it's not like a classical guitar. There's here, there's a fingerstyle type guitar. It doesn't really work like that. You can use any guitar for, and pl just play it in a fingerstyle uh, way. Um, certain guitars are probably better suited for that than others, but it's not like um, you couldn't play fingerstyle on anything, on electric. You know, I can play it on fingerstyle on electric. Tom is saying, how do you stay focused when there are so many things on guitar on YouTube? <laughs> uh, there you go. Here's, here's, here's my real answer, Tom. You ready? Um, it's easy, and I do it too, to go down the rabbit hole of looking at YouTube videos and, and this, and next thing you know, you've got, oh, oh, that's a good idea, and oh, five licks for this, and oh, the seven tips for that, and oh, oh it, it's all great. And next thing you know, you've blown an hour or two. You haven't touched your hands on your guitar yet, and you've had a lot of stuff thrown at you. All that was really interesting, but you turn off YouTube, and you kind of go, what was that? And hardly any of it sticks. So, um, what is going to make the most difference in your playing, and I'm real hesitant to say this, but I, because I, I, I'm in the business of creating guitar content as well, but the best thing you can do to learn, your best teacher, your best teacher is you and your own creativity, your own ingenuity, your own uh, just wanting to figure out the guitar. That is going to be your best teacher. That's been my best teacher, is is just me. My inquisitiveness uh, is is going to be my best teacher on guitar. I, I'm not saying that as eloquently as I would like to, but I, I really want you to hear that. Okay, there are a million, gazillion different websites and YouTube videos and tips and this and that, and they all have various amounts of of helpfulness, okay? The best helpfulness in me, in my own playing, is me sitting down with my guitar at the end of a day or at the beginning of a day when I don't have a bunch of distractions and I just start messing around with the guitar. What if I just took that shape and I just started moving it around? I move that same shape down a string set. Kind of has that open sound. So you see what I'm doing? I'm just kind of wondering on the guitar, what, what would this sound like? What happens if I move this finger? I wish I could say everything that I teach you is stuff I've been taught. A lot of it has, but a lot of it is just stuff that I have thought up and and figured out. Hey, that that sounds that sounds good. I wonder if I could What if I just keep that going? Was all that I'm just making it up I'm just exploring on the instrument that will be some of your best teaching is just you turning off the distractions and and focusing on your instrument 
if, if you have a tough time doing that, if your mind races like mine does, you know what helps me? I got a, on my tuning app, actually. Uh, excuse me, on my metronome app. I get, it has a little timer down here in the bottom, and I'll say, I'm gonna practice for 20 minutes. And I turn my little thing off, and it just shows me 20 minutes. And then when it, at the end of it, it goes ding, and I'm done. That helps me stay focused and turn off all the distractions. So yes, there's tons of things that you can learn on that. And I'm not saying you shouldn't learn on that. That's great, but I'd say it's easy, easy, easy to get distracted. We are such a distracted uh, society. It is fun to be distracted. Uh, it is much less fun to just sit in our similar self and start to enjoy the sounds that we're making on the instrument. That's where you're going to start getting the real gold and the real progress on your instrument. There you go. John, uh, 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 John, I'm going to mispronounce your name. John, what, what, Wajlowitz, uh, absolute beginner, and I can't seem to get can't seem to get it. Two questions. Is electric guitar easier to learn on than acoustic? The short answer is yes. The the action on an electric guitar is generally lower, the action being the distance from the strings to the fret. If that's too high, it's just going to be really tough to play. So the action generally on electric is a little bit lower, so it's just physically a little bit easier to play. Uh, do I have a good lesson for scales? Good lesson for scales. <clears throat> well, uh, I think we do have... Um, there's a fretboard workout that I did on um, uh, major scale mastery, major scale mastery. I think I did a one and two on that, too. Uh, Diane, can you can put up the link to that. Um, fret, fret, fretboard workouts, major scale mastery, one and two, I think. Um, that's the best stuff I know about learning scales and, and, and the shapes and how to play them on guitar. So that's, that's, that's some things for you to, for you to think about. Um, Brian's saying, do I have a suggested humidity percentage to achieve for guitars? Eesh, I'm going to botch this because I know uh, we've had Greg Voros, who's the, who's the head of guitar repair at Groon Guitars, and he's much more accomplished uh, at this. I believe what he recommends is 40% humidity, if, if I remember right, 45, something like that. So somebody can correct me wrong if I'm, if I'm completely um, um, screwed up on that, but I believe that's what he suggests. Uh, for keeping your guitars done. The main thing about, can I just say, the main thing on, on, on uh, um, humidity on your guitars is you just don't want to be stupid, okay? I don't want to take my guitar out in the middle of the rainforest and go camping for three weeks and leave my guitar underneath a tree, okay? That's dumb, okay? I don't want to be in Arizona where it's 115 degrees and 5% humidity and and leave my guitar out un, unhumidified. Okay, so you just want to, it, 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 if you, you don't really, it doesn't really matter if you're, you know, 45 or 42 percent. Don't, don't get that, that crazy about it. It just matters, stay away from the extremes. Don't get your guitar super damp. That's going to screw it up and it's going to mess up the wood. Don't get your guitar super dry. Okay, so if you live in a very arid environment, if it's in the middle of winter and the heater is on all the time, get yourself a little humidifier. And uh, it'll be good for your skin, it'll be good for your guitars. Or keep your guitars in your case, keep a little humidifier uh, in your case. A little damp it or, or something like that to just be smart about it. So I don't really go crazy with humidifying your guitars, but it is a smart thing to do and you just want to stay away from the extremes on that. Um, uh, Brian Snyder is saying, is there any publication that helps with memorization of triads, fretboard, and such? Um, uh, I, did, I did a triad workout. Uh, that's all free. That's on uh, 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 our YouTube, Guitar Gathering YouTube channel, which you're on now. It's one of the playlists. Try it. Hold it a series on triads and a big PDF for that, 30 pages or something like that. It's all free. Just go through that. Um, um, and I also did one on memorizing the fretboard. So that, that would be it. We've covered so many things over, over that COVID 2020 year that there's a lot of good stuff there. So uh, kind of go back through our videos and you'll see one on memorizing the fretboard and also our big series on triads, which is a, that was a great one. Um, what type of capo do I suggest for electric? Uh, Jim, uh, <laughs> I wish I could say uh, it's this or that. Here's what, here's what, what's the best capo? The one that's handy. <laughs> The one that's in my guitar case, that's the best capo. Um, here's the ones I like. 
Okay, so here's my my little pencil case filled with all of my guitar hoodads and whatnots. Um, in here, I've got a G7th capo. Now, in, usually in my guitar cases, actually the individual cases, I've got Kaiser capos, um, which are just which are great too. They clamp your guitar. Sometimes the, they have a tendency to pull your guitar out of strings out of tune because it just clamps at, at a at a at a very high pressure. These you can, it's kind of like a mini ratchet system, and I can control the uh, amount of tug on the on the strings. So these little G7s are a little bit more expensive, but you can control the amount of pressure put on the string, and so I like those as well. Somebody got me a Thalia, Thalia capo, and it's gorgeous. I use it all the time. It's over there when I'm doing lessons on my other computer. Uh, I use that one. So, um, and there's different types. I like G7s. Um, uh, they're kind of the ones that I tend to gravitate toward quite a bit, is the, is the G7 ones. Um, <clears throat> Thomas is saying, do you have, how do you organize all your songs? Or do you have paper laying around everywhere too? The short answer is, yes, I have paper laying around everywhere all the time. I play just so much, um, um, so much. I've got books and books, and I'm playing on an average week. I'm doing a couple of broadcasts here. I may be playing uh, at, at our church. I may have rehearsals going on. I may be playing a wedding uh, in, in, uh, on the weekend, and there's rehearsals for that. I may be preparing for other stuff that I have to do as well. So over the course of a week, I've... I'm working on seven, eight, ten, twelve tunes uh, that I'm having to come up with various arrangements for this. So, do I have a lot of that music written down? Almost all of it. If, if I, hopefully, I have all of it, because I don't want to have to figure it out again. So, I've got lots of books with lots of uh, music lying around. Now, is it all unorganized? No, I got it pretty well organized because um, I need to know how to get to it when I when I need it. So, uh, and another thing is they've got the iPad thing now too where you can put your music on an iPad. I have not made the galactic switch to that yet, but it's eminent. I see the writing on the wall. My days of using paper charts are getting limited. It's just so, there's so much music now. You can, uh, it's just easier to do it on an iPad. You can get real books on iPad now uh, as PDFs and, and just scroll through them like that. Um, uh, there's a couple of good uh, programs for that. Four Score, I believe, is one of them. F O R E Score is one for doing um, uh, music on iPad. So I would suggest that as well. So that's a good way to keep keep track of things. Um, uh, do, uh, Jim is saying, do you use a guitar with high action to play slide? Yes, I don't do a lot of slide, uh, but those that do use a high action because it's really tough to do it on a low action guitar. There's just too many things. Um, um, that could buzz around. Uh, Nancy, how do you get to the point of faking it as you did in that beautiful song? I'm still dependent on sheet music. Not much memorization for me yet either. Um, um, <sighs> well, Nancy, I have no slick answer for that. You want to know what the answer is? Do it for 40 years. And then you you kind of get pretty easy with faking it. Um, you just do it a lot, and you play these songs a lot, and you noodle around on your instrument a lot. Um, you know, I noodle around constantly. What do I mean by noodling? Sounds like a song, doesn't it? I'm just going through random chord changes. How'd you learn to do that? <laughs> learn? I'm just wobbling, wobbling through chord changes. You know where I learned to do that? When you're playing at a wedding and the dumb uh, uh, bridal party is taking an extra five minutes and you've run out of music. Then you start learning how to do that real good. I could do it all day and have done it. Now let's make it a little bit more sound like a melody. Well, 
what was that? I don't know. I'm just making it up. I'm just making it up. And I throw a little melody on it, and it sounds convincing enough. Um, how did I learn to do that? Gosh, playing way too many uh, four-hour restaurant gigs when you only have about two hours worth of songs. You learn how to stretch things a long time. I could, I like that, uh, uh, what was I doing that song earlier? Uh, Jay-Z Joy of Man's Desiring? So I get to the end of that. Uh, how long can I stretch this? I could go for days. And it doesn't really bother you because it's just kind of nice music in the background. Your ear really doesn't gravitate to it until I start playing a melody. Ah, then your ear goes, oh, I know what that is. But what if I go back into my melody, my fakeness? So some of it is kind of knowing how chords are flowing into each other, and so you can kind of mimic that and 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 uh, um, try and create longer progressions that way. Now some of the 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 faking it is just knowing the melody and how chords are working. So a lot of that just comes with experience. I don't want I don't want to blow off your question, but I'm saying a lot of it just comes from experience. You you just do it a lot and you get a lot better at it. Uh, man, I have made, half of my career is noodling. Uh, it is just noodling, keeping the music going. Um, and it's something I've learned to do and do a lot, uh, do a lot of it. Uh, Don is saying, can I leave my Gibson J15 out on a stand at all times instead of putting it back in its case after playing? Well, if you've got a safe house, what I mean by that is there's not, you know, big animals or, 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 or small children. Um, going by that would be playing and and would have a chance of knocking over your instrument if there's if if you're in a relatively safe space then yeah leave it out by golly leave it out so that way when you're ready to play and you got five minutes you can you can um, um, grab your guitar rather than having it in its case in the closet where you've got to go and you got to get all your stuff out and it's going to take five minutes for you to do that next thing you know you want to be on to something else but if I have my guitar out right next to my desk or right next to my couch when I'm there, then I'll e easily grab it and just start messing around. Next thing you know, you've got 10, 15 minutes worth of practicing in and you weren't even trying just because it was out. So if you have a, if you have the ability to have it out, I always recommend that. If you have a, a, a house that's got a lot of activity and it could get knocked over, then you may want to keep it in a little bit of a safer place. If you have a house that's got a, that has some, uh, varies a lot in humidity, then you may want to keep it in its case as well. You don't want to do, you know, don't want to put it next to a heater vent. I don't want to put it next to the window, things like that. Uh, you want to be smart about kind of where it's at. But if it's out, then you're able to play it. So um, Doug is, Douglas is asking, is focusing on down picking better than alternating? Well, no, I wouldn't say that because you're going to need them both. So let me give everybody a good picking exercise. If you have like a G chord. So a good picking exercise is not just strumming, which you can do, but to hit the sixth string and then the chord, and the fifth string and the chord, and the fourth string and the chord, the third string, of course there's only two strings left, second string, and then you could do the top one, but it's just going to be repeating, so you might as well just stay on the second. See what I'm doing? I'm just kind of sixth string chord, fifth string. I'm just going through each string and the notes on that string with the chord. 
That's tough. That's tough to do. It's a good little picking exercise for doing things like that. Um, Dennis is saying, um, I've developed a bad habit of stopping and correcting mistakes. Okay for practice, not so much for performing. Yes, very true, very true. Uh, any pointers on how to break this habit? Well, there's, there's, two, there's two phases. There's the, the, the um, how should I put this? There's the workshop um, where you go in and you work on your car and you take it apart and you put it back together again, and you're working on your car. Uh, but then there's also, you take it out of that. If I'm getting ready to, to go to the car show, I need to polish it, and I need to get it all ready in that way. Think of that as you're, as you're doing guitar work as well. As I'm learning a song, uh, most of my time is going to be spent in the workshop, where I am you know, working through the tune... <laughs> I'm just working through the tune. I'm stopping. I'm starting. I'm, I'm doing all that sort of stuff. But don't forget that when you're getting ready to go, before you go into a performance, you've got to go into the polishing phase, which is a completely different phase. And most guitar players, especially in, uh, folks that don't do a lot of performing, never even think about that phase. But you start th when you do a lot of performing, you spend actually a, a lot of time in the polishing phase. And only rarely do you actually get back into the workshop if I need to actually figure out how to do something uh, particular on the instrument. A lot of my, my practicing these days on things that I already know is the polishing. So what do I do in the polishing phase? I play the song front to back. No matter what happens, I don't stop. I play it at tempo, so I'm working on tempo things. Uh, you don't realize how inconsistent you are until you actually start playing with a metronome or recording yourself. You'll be amazed at how inconsistent we are as, as players. We play things all the time. Um, now, I would never play that, perform it that way, and you wouldn't think to perform it that way either. But when we're in kind of, we're always in workshop mode, we're not even thinking about performance mode. But in performance mode, I've got to play it. So I'm thinking about performing the song. Two different skills. Two different skills. How do I how do I get out of sometimes you just have to take the song and say, hey, I've got to perform this tomorrow. It's coming out of the workshop. I can't work on it anymore. I gotta work on polishing it and making this where it as good as I'm gonna make it, I've gotta be able to perform it. It's not that it's perfect, but it's just it's as perfect as it's gonna get today and then you go into polishing mode. So one of the things I would work on, at least spend five, 10 minutes at the end of your practice time playing through the song front to back, front to back, front to back. Work on a little, oh, I kind of tripped over that one little sit uh, section there. I need to go back, maybe I need to take that and then go back in the workshop and work that out. But after that, I take it back and I put it in performance mode and I work it there. So don't forget about performance mode. It's a very, um, very, um, um, important part of things. All right. All right. Wow. So many. Um, Mark Jones is asking a great question. Is noodling the same as practicing? No, 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 no. It is not. It is not. Don't get confused. Don't get confused. Noodling in the, in the, it's funny to be talking, in the sense of I'm just improvising chord progressions. is different from just piddling around on the instrument, okay? So don't get don't get the two confused. If, if you're just sitting around on the instrument, kind of half watching TV, you're half scrolling on YouTube and you kind of go every now and then you kind of plunk around a little bit, you're, you're not getting anything done. You may be entertaining yourself, but you're not getting any sort of progress. You want to get progress, you got to go into practice mode. Cut off the distractions and start working on things that you cannot do. That's practice mode. So I don't waste my time playing a bunch of things that I already know. I go right to the one thing I can't play, and I do the hard, disgusting work of trying, hearing myself screw it up. I need to do all of that so that the progress happens. For me practicing, I can't do a whole lot of practicing. I do good to get 20, 30 minutes a day of practicing. 
of that level of practicing, but me playing around with tunes does not count as practicing. For me, what counts as practicing is when I'm actually working on something that I cannot do, and I'm working seriously on that.